It is great, great to be with you this morning. Great to see uh, all of your faces on the Lord's Day here as we get to worship together. Uh, we are going to be this morning uh, looking at some principles for marriage, looking at Ephesians 5. We've been in uh, student ministries with the junior high and high schoolers looking at Ephesians 5, talking about biblical manhood, biblical womanhood, marriage. So this is really uh, an overflow of some of that study that I just wanted to share, share with you all. And just to give you a quick roadmap of where we're going with the equipping hour, uh, the month of October is, uh, is Reformation Month. Uh, October 31st, 1517 is an important date in church history when Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses to the door of the church in Wittenberg. And that's a, just a marker, uh, a date in history that we, we kind of tie to this, this period of Reformation where the church uh, really rediscovered the, the gospel, rediscovered the authority of Scripture. So we're going to spend the five Sundays in October in equipping hour going through these uh, they're called five solas of the Reformation, these uh, battle cries, talking about the authority of Scripture and really the, the gospel message through faith, uh, through faith alone, by grace alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. So next week, uh, Sunday morning, Scott Demarest will be talking about the authority of Scripture, sola scriptura. So I invite you to, to be here for that, and uh, I'm going to open our time in prayer, and then we will jump in. So please pray with me. Lord Jesus, we thank you that we have an opportunity to gather as your people, that we have an opportunity to hear your word, we have an opportunity to sing your praises. I pray that our hearts would be aligned around your truth, Jesus. I pray that we would hear your words. I pray that we would submit under your words. And Jesus, we pray that you would be exalted. I pray that your people uh, here in this room would be more conformed to your image and that you would draw praise out of our hearts even this morning. We pray all these things, Jesus, for your, for your name, for your glory. Amen. Well, I have uh, titled this message, uh, Mistakes Husbands Make. Mistakes Husbands Make. I had someone uh, ask me, uh, okay, so is the, wives, is the wives' version next week? And I said, I don't, I don't have the courage to, to teach that lesson, so someone else has got to do that one. But uh, this one, I can, I can speak more from personal experience. So, you know, maybe it's mistakes that I have made, mistakes that Kyle makes, but... Uh, mistakes husbands make, and really uh, just want to put in front of you just some, some pitfalls, some dangers to avoid as we think about love, relationships, marriage. Uh, just want to put in front, hopefully everyone in here can benefit, whether you're married or not, we can look at what is a sacrificial love in a marriage, what is a biblical submission under the lordship of Christ. These are principles for all of life, for any human relationship. And, and the mistakes here, I'm not going to give you a list of uh, 18 things, it's really just two categories. So pretty, pretty simple this morning, just two categories in the realm of uh, your responsibility and, and your authority. For the man to, to embrace his responsibility and to, to embrace the, the God-given authority that he has. A friend of mine was telling me a story recently about his son, his nine-year-old, who said to him, Dad, it must be really cool to be the boss because you get to fire people. I would love to be the boss. I'd love to fire people someday. And, uh, you know, it's funny when a kid says that, but, but clearly he doesn't understand authority, right? He wants to wield authority for his own ends. Man, it'd be really fun to tell someone what to do. You know, we can laugh when, when a kid says this. It's, it's funny. It's comical. But, but we actually do this in the way that we approach marriage even. You know, not, not so much. No, no one is saying, at least outright, hopefully, man, I can't wait to be, to be married. No guy, young man is saying, I want to tell someone what to do. Hopefully they don't say that. You know, run from that young man if that's what he's saying. But, but we treat marriage this way when we, we treat marriage as a, as a means to our own ends. We look to a, a spouse to, to satisfy our own desires. Look to a spouse to satisfy sexual cravings, to, to satisfy a love of comfort, to give me some kind of purpose and significance, you know, to build this picturesque life that I've always wanted. And, and the spouse becomes a means to, to my own end. And we see this in, in teenage. If you watch teenage dating relationships, you see this. Or you have two different parties here. That, that both love getting attention. I, I love how it feels when he gives me attention, and, and she loves how it feels when I give her attention. So let's both just commit to giving each other attention. Let's both commit to actually fueling idolatry in each other, because it feels good. You know, just promoting self-love. We're going to be exclusive in our idolatry toward one another. I mean, that's, that's so many uh, dating relationships. I just want to feel good, and this person is the, the means to get there. So I want to put in front of you this morning a, a right view of sacrificial love, a, a right view of service, uh, to embrace the, the role that God has given for the sake of, of service, mutual service of Christ. 
So there's some passages that we're going to look at, really three passages we're going we're to flip through. Uh, Genesis 2, uh, Ephesians 5, and 1 Peter 3. So you'll see those on the screen. So we're going to flip back and forth. So just kind of keep your hand in those. We'll start in Ephesians 5 so you can turn there. And we'll be looking at just, just really drawing some implications, uh, making some observations from some of these passages. And we're going to talk about love, sacrifice, submission, uh, leadership in marriage. And for many years, I, I worked for my father-in-law, who was just a really excellent businessman. And he used to always uh, talk about this principle. When you're setting someone up for success in a, in a leadership role in a company, he would say they have to have both authority and responsibility. They have to have authority and responsibility. If, if you don't have one of those two, if those are out of whack, you're not going to be able to do your job well. A responsibility, meaning that the buck has to stop with you. That you have to be held accountable. You know, your job, your promotion, your pay, or whatever it might be, is tied to this, this business unit performing, whatever you're leading. And you also have to have the authority. You have to have the uh, empowerment, the ability to actually make change. You have to have both of those things. You know, for example, if someone's managing a, a sales team, and they have certain metrics they're trying to hit, and they have the responsibility to, to lead that team, that person must be empowered. They must have the authority to actually make change. They have, to, they have to be able to hire and fire people. They have to be able to redirect people. If they don't have that authority, then they're not, they're not able to actually do this responsibility well. And vice versa. You know, someone that has the authority, they can, they can hire, they can fire, but doesn't bear any responsibility, doesn't bear the weight of those decisions. That's just a recipe for disaster. You're not going to succeed in, in the business world. And I, and I think it's helpful, just those principles, just to give us some categories to think about, some, some areas just to, to hang our thoughts on as we think about leadership in a marriage. The, the same principles, the authority and responsibility. The, the two mistakes that I want to talk about is someone who doesn't embrace their responsibility, doesn't take ownership, and the other one who, who doesn't hold their authority rightly. They try to manipulate, they try to coerce, they try to force someone to, get what they, to do what they want. So really, the, these two issues in view, embracing the responsibility that God has given and to, to view the authority in the way that God intended. And the dangers, the mistakes, you could say, is on one hand, the passive husband, and on the other hand, would be the authoritarian husband. The passive husband, the one who doesn't seem to care, and on the other side, the one who wants to, to force his own will. To, to manipulate, to coerce. So both of these mistakes here, authority and responsibility. Well, let's start uh, with the middle ground. If these are the, the mistakes, what we want to avoid, let's, let's look at Ephesians 5 and just, just look at what, what should we be going after. What's the, the, the right picture of marriage? Look at Ephesians 5, just verses 22 through 25. Here's the, the biblical picture of marriage. Paul says, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be subject to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. So clearly we see uh, Ephesians 5.22 there is a, an authority structure in view. The wife is subject to her husband. The, the, the husband has the authority to lead. God-given authority. And in, in 525, the husband takes that authority. He embraces it. What does he do? Well, he leads in love. Sacrificial love. All the way back in Genesis 2, God made this distinction. Man and woman different. Uh, part of his order in creation. Part of the order that he created. A, a man's leadership. A husband wielding this authority, but how does he wield it? He wields it in love, sacrificial love. The kind of love that Jesus displayed as he gave himself up to the cross. So my goal this morning is to encourage us, to encourage the men, to encourage the, the families, to encourage the young men and, and the wives, all of us in here, to, to embrace this, this uh, ultimate relationship that God has, this relationship that puts on display the love of Christ, that we have an opportunity in our marriages, in our homes, to put on display a, a transformed life. To say, my life has been so transformed by the gospel that I want to love my, life, my wife in this way, to, to put on display Christ, to show his grace and the power of the gospel. And this morning, we're going to look at these two mistakes. Uh, like I said, one, passivity, you could call it. The other, maybe heavy-handedness, uh, laziness, uh, domineering. 
or in the categories of to, to own your responsibility and to hold your authority rightly. So number one, uh, embrace responsibility versus making excuses. Embrace responsibility, that would be the positive. The, the mistake would be to make excuses, to not take ownership. A passive leader is one who puts up all these barriers, makes excuses instead of actually leading. To embrace responsibility is to take ownership, to embrace what God says about marriage. That's where we have to start, not just a mental assent, but in the heart, agree, yes, God, you have given me this responsibility. I've been entrusted with this stewardship. For a husband to feel the weight, to say, this keeps me up at night, this drives me to prayer, this burden for the leadership of my home. To say that the direction of our family, the spiritual climate of our family rests on me. Men, you carry this burden. You are the protectors, the providers, the leaders. So the mistake here comes in a lack of ownership, a lack of stewardship, a passivity. Just simply existing in a marriage without leading. And you can look across our society and obviously see a lack of leadership, a lack of male leadership a lack of, of, of godly men. But even in the church, you could look across churches and you find a lot of godly single ladies waiting for godly men. You, you find a lot of wives even, sadly, further along than their husbands, just waiting for their husbands to lead. And what this church needs, what this world needs, is men who are willing to lead, who take this ownership, take this responsibility, this God-given burden. And let's start back at the beginning. Turn to Genesis chapter 2. I just want to make a couple observations. Just from the beginning, God, God's plan here, the way that God intended this, the, the differences that God made, man and woman different, to, to complement each other for his work in the world. Genesis 2, verse 18. This is uh, day six of creation. Genesis two eighteen. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Now of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. So Adam here is in charge, uh, cultivating the earth, God's subregion, naming the animals, subduing the earth. And it says here that he cannot do this work alone. He needs someone to come alongside of him. And you see God solving this problem. Verse 22, the Lord God fashioned into woman from man. And just a a few observations, nothing new, nothing shocking here, but just to say that man and woman are, are different, are created different. Adam was created first. We see it here, we saw it in Ephesians 5. He he is in charge, he is leading. The the wife, Eve, comes along to help, to compliment him. They do not have the the same roles. They do not have the same responsibilities. They do not have the same authority. And these differences complement each other. Adam needs a co-laborer. In verse 18 and 20, it uses this word helper. There is a helper suitable for him. Verse 18, verse 20, the same word. There was not found a helper. You know, people use, like to use the word helpmate. I I don't like that word because it sounds, it sounds weak, you know, like daddy's little helper. I like to think of it as a strengthener. The wife is a strengthener to the man. This word helper in the Old Testament is used of God bringing help to the Israelites in battle, bringing military help, bringing aid, bringing strength to them. So God here is actually saying Adam has weaknesses and the woman is going to strengthen those weaknesses so that together they can serve the Lord together. They're going to serve the Lord more robustly together. They're going to be more fruitful in their service because they are together, strengthening each other. And these differences are not a matter of value, not even a matter of ability. My my wife, if any of you know my wife is better than me at 90% of things that we do. It's not a matter of value or ability. But these differences are are a matter of function. The way that God has intended the world to operate under his control. 1 Peter 3 says that they are both co-heirs of life. But here, the the man is the leader. Ephesians 5.22, the the wife is to submit. Different roles, different functions. You know, God as king, this is how he wants to rule his creation. So to embrace this responsibility is to embrace these distinctions, to own it. For for a man to lead is to, you think about your week, making a to-do list. Here's all the things I have to do this week. 
to not leave out this most important duty, to, to lead your family, to love your wife. And we have to get out of our mind that giving direction, even telling someone what to do is pride. That is not pride. You can do it proudly. You can want a position of authority because of pride. But to embrace the responsibility is actually humble. In a battle, you think about a battle, a general giving direction, telling people what to do that's for their safety. You know, a father telling his child not to run in the, in the street. That is for their safety. That's for their good. The embracing these distinctions is, is actually humble. If they are given by God, then humility says, yes, Lord, I want to submit under what you have said. To erase these distinctions, that, that is pride. To say, God, I know what is best. I, I hear what you say in Genesis 2, but you don't understand the 21st century, it's different. The wife who rejects her role under authority, that's pride. The, the husband who rejects his responsibility to lead, that is pride. And it's hard because our flesh doesn't want to submit and our flesh doesn't want to lead. Our sinful flesh wants comfort. We want ease. We, we don't want to be proactive. We don't want to say hard things. We don't want to upend the peace. We don't want to make hard decisions. We don't want to jump in the mix and do the hard work. We just want comfort. We just want to enjoy life. I've heard one pastor talk about just if a man will not take the ownership, the leadership, that, that any human institution will end in egalitarianism without leadership. If a man will not say, I'm going to lead, the same thing happens in the home. If men will not lead, there, there will not be leadership without someone taking ownership, saying, I have to go after this. I have to embrace it. And I said here, the, the opposite here, making excuses. So often we make excuses. We won't take responsibility because we come up with justifications. We come up with all these reasons why we can't lead. But a, a passive leader is one who makes excuses. Our kids do this so well. All, right, all of you moms know, as you ask your kids, you know, if you ask them, why, why isn't your room clean? And you know the response you're going to get. It's going to start with a story. You know, a long time ago, there was a king in a foreign land. <laughs> Let me tell you all the, all the details, this whole situation. You know, you get all this information. And you're like, you know, I, I thought about, like, I didn't realize we were raising the next J.R.R. Tolkien here. You know, I, I just try to figure out why your sister's crying. And you're giving me the whole backstory of Hobbiton and... <laughs> in the Shire, in, in the whole history here. But, but that's what we do, right? We get more sophisticated than this, but we have reasons, these backstories, these excuses. I'm not going to, to listen to what she's saying because she didn't say it in the way that I wanted her to. She didn't bring that to me in the way I wanted to hear it, so I'm not going to listen. I don't have to listen to what she said. I'm not going to have this conversation because it didn't go well last time. Or, or we might even make it sound virtuous. I'm not going to start a conversation about our budget because I want to be a peacemaker in the home. But this is what we do. We make excuses instead of owning the responsibility. In Genesis, look over at chapter 3. You know chapter 3, the fall of man, the first sin, when Eve eats the fruit. And she usurps the role of Adam here. She clearly is taking leadership. And Adam, what is he doing? He is passively watching. And you're left asking, Adam, where were you? when the snake is tempting your wife? Why are you watching passively? You're supposed to be the watchman. You're supposed to be leading. You're supposed to be protecting her, looking out in front of her, and you're watching this happen. And look at Genesis 3, when God confronts them. Genesis 3, starting in verse 8. It says, They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. The Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? In verse 10, you get the, the back story, the same thing that our kids do. He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. He's got this whole story. He's got all these reasons. And then God says, in verse 11, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? And look at now the excuse starts. The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. So once he is indicted, the excuses come. Whose fault is it? Adam, you're the leader. You're the provider. You're the protector. And he says, it's her fault. I had no choice. I couldn't have done it differently. You don't understand the pressure I was under. And then more insidious. He says, the woman that you gave me, 
God, this is also your fault. It's her fault and it's your fault. It's just not my fault. And what is this? You know, Adam is passive in his leadership. And the passive leader, what does he do? He makes excuses. He finds people to blame. He doesn't take responsibility. I was reading an article recently, uh, just a, a tragedy of a, a 24-year-old that was trying to steal a woman's car. And this 24-year-old kid just wanted a car and he ended up killing the woman as he stole her car. He left behind a note, an apology. And the, the apology in this note that he wrote, it said, I didn't mean to hurt anyone. It was my only option. It was my only option. Just this heinous excuse. I had to do this. I had nothing else I could do. I was between a rock and a hard place. And this is the heart of man on display. We make excuses. We justify sin. When I say make excuses, it's to justify. To justify something you should be doing. Justify sin. To say, no, 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 you don't understand. You know, to say, she, this woman you gave me, I couldn't. You don't understand. You don't have all the backstory. All these excuses that we use to justify our, our passive leadership. And the, and the Bible demands that we take ownership. If any of you are sports fans, uh, you watch, if you ever watch press conferences after a football game, baseball game, and uh, what drives me nuts, every press conference, the losing team, we're watching the football season right now, the losing, losing coach always says something like, yeah, we were unprepared, we got to do better next week, I'll get them prepared next week to, to play harder, to play better, to work on the mistakes. You know, that's, that's, I guess that's right, you know, he's not blaming the players. But after the, the first time, the second time, but then the eighth time, he says the same thing. Yeah, we'll get, we'll get them next time. It's on me. I got to prepare better. You know, just to, to see the issue, to give the canned response. Yep, I'm responsible. I'll get it fixed. Right? It's so hollow. Right? It's easy for us to see the issue. It's easy for us to diagnose, to say, yeah, there, there are some problems here. But we could so often be the James 1 man, the man who sees himself in the mirror, who walks away and does nothing, forgets what he looks like. So it's not enough just to agree Embracing responsibility isn't just agreeing, it's doing, doing something, it's working hard, it's being diligent, it takes labor, it takes being proactive. Turn back to Ephesians 5. This responsibility is more than just uh, saying the right words to please others, but actually doing the work, the behind the scenes work that, that no one's going to see. Look at Ephesians 5.25 when he says, husbands love your wives just as Christ also loved the church. So we love our wives in the same way Christ loved the church. And look what he did. And he gave himself up for her. So Christ's love for the church led him to give himself. This ultimate sacrifice, giving himself up to the cross is what's in view. But his love led him to act. So he's saying love in this way. Husbands, love in this way to be proactive. To take the ownership. To say, I'm, gonna, I'm not just going to love. I'm going to now love in, in service. I'm going to die to myself. And just consider, husbands, the, the primary means that God has given for, for your wife's encouragement, support, to address weaknesses, to build her up. The, the primary means God has given is you, if you're married, to, to own that responsibility. And we could broaden out from just saying not making excuses. There's a lot of other ways passivity comes out. You know, it might just be laziness. I just don't have the fortitude to do the right thing. I just, I just love my own comfort. I'm just unwilling to change. But that's the, the same issue in the heart. We see something that we must do and we, we neglect it. I saw this concern, but I didn't address it. It wasn't really my obligation. You know, that, that is the same root issue, not, not taking ownership here. As we've been in this series with the, the students, we've been talking a lot about just cultivating the, this right attitude of, of taking responsibility wherever you find yourself. You know, if your mom says to clean your room, that you take responsibility. Do it without being asked. Take the trash out without being asked. To actually train your heart to embrace whatever responsibility you have. And one of our high school leaders challenged the guys. He said, here's a challenge for you. Why don't you go to your mom and ask her and say, Mom, I, I'd love to have more responsibility. Could I, could I have more chores? Could you hand me more chores so that I could grow in my diligence and my maturity? And he said, and then, and then have a, a camera handy so you can take a picture of her jaw hitting the floor when you ask her that. But this is, this is just basic Christianity. Christianity 101, that we are obligated. We are slaves of Christ. We are stewards, stewards of the, the gospel message, stewards of our time and our resources, stewards of our spiritual giftedness for the sake of, of growing the body, 
stewards of whatever responsibility, whatever leadership influence we have. So this isn't just a marriage issue. This is a Christianity issue. You are a slave of Christ, so you must embrace responsibility. And for husbands, you have stewardship over the soul of another, of wives and children. This dual reality that, yes, the wife is responsible before the Lord for her own soul. You know, she is responsible for her choices. She will stand before the Lord and answer for how she has submitted to your authority. And at the same time, husbands will stand before the Lord and answer for how they led, for how they cared for her soul. So that's the the first mistake, is to to make excuses rather than embracing responsibility. Second, in the realm of passivity, now on the other side, the the authoritarian, viewing authority wrongly, manipulation, heavy-handedness. So number two is to endear respect versus demand submission. To endear respect would be the positive, negatively to demand submission. As you talk about these weaknesses, it's not just one or the other. We can weave in and out of both of these. The, the passive leader becomes authoritarian when he doesn't get his way. When he's refused to embrace his responsibility, he's only left with being authoritarian. He's demanding submission because he hasn't led well. So that really, they go hand in hand. I've heard a pastor say it this way recently. He said, you can, you can lead your wife in such a way that she follows out of respect, or you can lead her in such a way that she is forced to follow only out of duty. You know, the godly wife will follow out of duty. She will follow because it's right. But what you want is for her to follow out of respect because she loves you and she respects you because she trusts your leadership. She finds safety in your leadership. So that's what I mean by enduring respect versus demanding submission. To not uh, badge her. You know, you take out the police badge with Ephesians 5.22 and say, hey, you need to submit. Look at Ephesians 5.22 to pull out your authority and say, you must do this. And I'm not saying that a husband will never have to have a hard conversation. You know, he may have to gently tell his wife in a hard situation, a hard decision, you know, I'm asking you to trust my leadership, to submit to this decision, and to entrust yourself to the Lord. I know it's hard. And you may not see it my way, but I'm asking you to trust me and ask you to, to submit under this. You know, that conversation probably will happen. What I'm saying is that shouldn't be an everyday conversation. That shouldn't be the staple of your leadership. And it does come down to how you view your authority, how you wield authority. The authority a husband has is delegated authority, a derived authority, not, not intrinsic, not something he possesses on his own. It is delegated from Jesus. Uh, Ephesians 1 says Jesus is seated in heaven, all authority. He is seated in victory. You think about the Great Commission, Matthew 28. All authority, Jesus says, in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority. Go make disciples. Go, go tell people this gospel message and plead with them to come under the authority of Christ. So Jesus, with all authority, has delegated his authority. Different realms in, in the earth. He has delegated authority to, to leaders, to kings and rulers, the Bible says, to lead nations. He has delegated authority to elders in a church to lead and feed God's people. And he has delegated authority in the home to, to fathers and to parents to lead their children. And whether or not the world around us agrees, whether or not a wife even agrees, this, this authority has been given by Christ. This is a biblical fact. A husband must feel the weight of this authority, this delegated authority. So the one who wants to, his wife to feel the weight of his authority might, might be having an issue that he's not feeling the weight of Christ's authority that's been given to him. That's why responsibility and authority go hand in hand. The authority comes from Christ. So now you bear this responsibility. You're not going to flex your own authority if you're going after his agenda, if you're submitting under his authority. So if I neglect my responsibility, it's because there's an issue with me embracing the lordship of Jesus Christ in some area of my life. So first, he must embrace that. That's the primary issue. As you talk about submission, a husband must embrace this delegated authority under the lordship of Christ, wielding authority only as a delegate of Christ for his purposes. Ephesians 5.22, it says, Wives, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord. So with Jesus in view, be subject to your husbands. Submitting to Christ's authority, now submit to the one that he's delegated authority to. And we talk about submission, 
I think it's helpful just to define submission. I saw this definition of a, a voluntary placing of oneself under the will of another. You know, it's an act of the will. So I'm going to voluntarily subject myself to someone else. This is a posture, a choice. I'm going to bring my will and my desires under your will, under what you think is right. And we talk about submitting to government. That's what we're saying. We're saying, I'm going to bring what I think is best under you. Not because I agree with you, but because God has placed you there. Our faith begins with a, a submission to Christ. You know, a will that's been transformed, but a, a decision of the will. To say, I want to submit under the lordship of Christ. I agree that you are God and I'm not. I agree that you are judge. I agree that I'm a lawbreaker. I agree that I'm guilty. I submit under your assessment of me. And we talk about the Great Commission. The call is to, to make disciples, not, not crusaders. We're not forcing people to submit. We're not forcing people to come to Christ. Right? We plead with them to come, and Christ has to change their will, give them a new heart. But you think about just church membership. It's voluntary. It's a voluntary membership. You have to, you have to say, yeah, I want to I opt in. I want to come under the, the leaders in this church. I want to submit myself under this because I, I think it's biblical. I think this is what Jesus, Jesus commands. So I want to voluntarily submit under this. You think about the difference between a biblical Christianity and a cult, right? Cults, you, you can't get out of. They manipulate. They coerce. Right? They force, they force adherence. In Christianity, you have to opt in and you might be forced out. You think about church discipline. You might be disfellowshipped if you're actually not submitting to the Lordship of Christ, but it is a voluntary membership. So as you think about, back to, to wives, if a, if a wife is having a hard time submitting, is the answer to, to force her, to demand submission? I think first you have to ask the question, why, why is it hard? What is making it hard? You know, the answer might be, the answer that we don't want to hear, is that somehow our leadership is actually making it hard, that we've actually made it hard. You know, there might be, yes, an underlying spiritual immaturity that she's wrestling with, but part of the issue is, is that we've actually made it difficult for her to follow. You know, we've maybe made poor decisions uh, with negative consequences, and she's just not quite ready to hold on for another roller coaster. So a lack of submission in a marriage is a, a manifestation of a problem, you could say. It's not the root of the problem. It's a manifestation of an underlying problem. Turn to, to 1 Peter chapter 3. You can uh, keep your hand in Ephesians 5. We'll flip back and forth here. But 1 Peter 3. This, this passage, the first uh, six verses, talk about the wife's submission to a husband. And it gives us a, a key to submission, how to cultivate a submissive heart. And it gives husbands some helps, how to come alongside of her. Uh, verse 3, Peter's talking about this adornment, this character, what characterizes a, a godly woman. And he's saying it must not be these externals, you know, external beauty. But verse 4 and 5, this is what should characterize a, a godly woman. But let it be her adornment, what characterizes her. Let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. For in this way, in former times, the holy women also, who hoped in God, used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. So the, the submissive wife, you see at the end of verse 5, what is her adornment? What characterizes her? Well, it says she has a, a gentle and quiet spirit in verse 4. Gentle and quiet spirit, not quiet in terms of personality, not a louder, quiet talker, but a, a quiet spirit in the sense of, in the face of distress. She is at peace. She's not railing against what God is doing. She's not fretful. She's not fearful. And it says her hope is in God in verse 5. They hoped in God. Those are the, the submissive wives, gentle and quiet spirit. Hope is in God. That's what characterizes them. And you get to verse 6, and it says, uh, example of Sarah who obeys Abraham and her submission, following Abraham into the unknown. And he gives this, this encouragement to do likewise, without, at the end of verse 6, without being frightened by any fear. So her submission, and wives, your submission, must be characterized by fearlessness. Like the Proverbs 31 woman, who can smile at the future without fear. You know, she can look at the face of an uncertain future. 
without any fear because she fears the Lord. So based on 1 Peter 3, what characterizes biblical submission? Well, it's characterized by a hope in God, a confidence, a heart that is not fearful or fretful, a confident in God's character, in God's ability. I am confident that God will do what he says he will do. I trust his character. I trust that he has power. I trust that he loves me because he says. And that's what Ephesians 5.22, and it says, Wives, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord, because you're ultimately submitting to the Lord's purposes. So back to the question, if a wife is having a hard time submitting, and looking at 1 Peter 3, what does she need? She, she doesn't need first to be badged with, here's my authority, Ephesians 5.22, submit. She needs to trust God's character. She needs to be fed God's truth. If she's struggling to have a submissive heart, it's a, it's a lack of faith. She's having a hard time trusting God's purposes. And unfortunately, sometimes our hard leadership makes it harder for her. You know, poor leadership. I'm having a hard time trusting that, that you place this guy as my leader because of all these poor decisions he's made. So what she needs is she needs a husband who's going to put in front of her the, the glory of God in Scripture, the authority of Scripture. She needs to be comforted with God's character. She needs to see his goodness and his power. She needs to be fed with truth, you know, to take her by the hand and to, to lead her to the only thing that will nourish her soul, God's word. And if, if the husband starts there, if you start there in a conversation with your wife, that, that changes the conversation around submission. Because all of a sudden, what she will feel most is not that I want you to submit to me. What she will feel most is I want you to submit to the authority of Jesus Christ. Because I love your soul. And I want what God wants for you. That you would be conformed to the image of Christ. And the one who is being conformed to Christ's image, the one who is submitting under his lordship, is going to submit to all of his commands. Is going to eagerly embrace them. I mean, our kids need to grasp this same thing. Ephesians 6.1 it says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. That is to say, it is right in God's eyes. God says it's right. So in their obedience, they need to be most aware of God. So yes, we need to teach them to obey Ephesians 6.1. We keep that verse in front of them often. But they need all of Scripture. They need to see that there is a big God. They need to see his power and his sovereignty. They need to see that this all-powerful God who created you, who sustains you, he gave commands. And he placed parents over you. I mean, this is the same way we must submit to government, not because they are right. I mean, not many of us right now are going around saying, Amen, government, government's doing so well. I love our leaders. But no, I'm going to have a respectful posture to the government. Not complaint, not anger, not badgering, but respect because I trust that God's sovereign hand has placed them there. Regardless of how high the gas prices are. But, but husbands, we can't sit here and, and rail against the government, you know, complain about authority in our lives, and then say, why are you complaining about my authority? Why aren't you submitting to my authority? We need to help cultivate a submissive attitude, a submissive heart. So are, are you helping your wife have a, a submissive heart by pointing her to the Lord? By pointing her to the trustworthiness and faithfulness of God? That is what's going to be most helpful to your wife as, as she works through submission. This will endear respect. Talk about endearing respect here. To, to help her cultivate a right attitude toward Christ's authority. And there's some really helpful ways in, in both of these passages to talk about endearing respect. Some things we can do practically. What does it look like to endear respect? To work hard? To build trust with a wife? Well, it has to start with, with our point one. Uh, embracing responsibility. A wife will respect a husband who leads diligently who is proactive, who is courageous. You will not endure respect if you shy away from obligations. You know, wives want to follow a leader who takes responsibility. They, they want to find protection and safety in your leadership. I uh, told you about, I'm obviously a college football fan, mentioned a press conference earlier, but if any of you have been following college football and seeing Deion Sanders, the University of Colorado, actually got destroyed last night. But up until last night, it was a great, it was a great story. But I was reading an article, it was really, really interesting about Deion Sanders, is the, the respect that people have for him 
because he's actually said really hard things. Because he's taken a, what he calls an old school approach. He came in the, the first day, there was a one win team. They were like one in 11, terrible football team. And he basically said, hey, you have to earn your place here. You know, if you guys want to play Division I college football, you actually have to, to earn your place. And, and you guys won one game last year, so probably half of you are Division II football players. You can't be here. And, and you say, man, that's harsh. But, then, but people love him because he actually tells the truth. And in the, the article, I just love this quote. It says, he believes overall that telling the truth is good for student athletes. <laughs> what do you know? Telling the truth is good for them. To actually have hard conversations countercultural for us to, to, to see that respect is earned by saying hard things, doing hard things, you know, speaking the truth in love, you know, avoiding hard conversations, never, never telling the truth, never confronting sin, doesn't cultivate respect. But to say, I, I respect you because I, I know you love me. I know you'll do anything for me. I know you'll even tell me hard things because you love me. So you, you have to own your responsibility to endear this kind of respect. But there are some, just some really helpful principles in Ephesians 5. Back in Ephesians 5, keep your hand in 1 Peter 3 because we'll turn back here one more time. But Ephesians 5, uh, just a helpful principle in terms of how to endure respect. What does it look like? Ephesians 5, 28 and 29. talks about the husbands, how they should love their wives. 5, 28. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church. So you have a picture there in, that, in those verses of a man taking care of his own body, saying in the same way that you feed yourself and clothe yourself, and you've done that since your birth. That's just your natural reaction. That's your, your basic instinct. You must bring your wife into that. So now your natural instinct, your natural reaction is to care for her needs, to take care of her like that. So to think about her comfort in the ways you've thought about your own comfort. To think about her needs as much as you think about your own needs. You know, think about how a a situation affects her just as much as you're thinking about how it affects me. And he uses the word uh, to nourish and cherish. Jesus as the example. He provides. He nourishes. He meets our needs. He strengthens us. In the same way, do these things for your wife. Protect, provide, appreciate, meet physical needs, meet spiritual needs. That's how you endear respect. And turn back to uh, 1 Peter 3, verse 7, this really critical verse for, for marriage, for husbands. The husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way, as with someone weaker, since she is a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life, so that your prayers would not be hindered. So he's saying live, live in an understanding way with someone who is weaker. Well, it means, that at least implies that you actually know, you've actually worked through what are her weaknesses. In what ways is she weaker? It means you've actually spent time getting to know her. You've listened to her. You've listened to what her needs are. You've actually watched how she he responds. You've watched how she handles things. You know what she can handle and what she can't handle. You, you see how situations affect her. You're able to provide her strength and stability when she's struggling. You know when you can push on something, when you need to to back off a little bit. And wives can tell pretty quickly when we we actually care about their needs versus when we're trying to just get them somewhere. There's a difference in saying, I just want to love you where you're at. I want to help you where you're at and saying, no, no, I want you to get here. I'm going to do whatever it takes to get you where I want you to be. And you endear love, you endear respect when you genuinely love her. For, for her to know that he, he cares about me. He actually loves me. He actually wants to, to meet my needs. He actually wants to come alongside me. And the same goes for the wife. Proverbs 31 talks about the excellent wife. In verse 11, this phrase, it says, the heart of her husband trusts in her. So this excellent wife, the heart of her husband trusts in her. His core response, you know, what he thinks when no one is looking, in his heart of hearts, it's trust. You know, not just marital fidelity. Clearly that would be in view. But I think broader, for him at a heart level to trust her, is to, to have confidence, to know that she supports him. He's not worried that she has some hidden agenda. He's not worried that she's manipulating him for something else. He, he knows that she is for him, even when he makes mistakes, even when he leads poorly, that she won't change her disposition to him. Her, her, his heart trusts in her. So this respect is mutual, mutual trust. 
to know that you love him where he is at. All the weaknesses, all the inconsistencies, all the, the annoyances. And likewise, you love her where she is at. That's the foundation for any relationship. This mutual respect, mutual love. And this is required in a marriage. And the same disposition in our parenting, to not be agenda-driven. To not say, I want you to obey to get to this level of conformity so that I look good, so that my life goes better. But saying to your kids, I love you, I care about you, I'm going to address sin in you because I love you, because that's going to be best for your soul. I'm not upset. I'm not upset at you at all, but, but I'm actually going to correct this issue because that is best for you. Our, our kids, our wives, need to know that we love them. That, that we will be honest with them. That, that we trust God's word and we're going to bring it to them. Not because we're disappointed, not because they, they let us down, but simply because we love them. And it's amazing how different a conversation sounds, how different the flavor of a conversation is when it's marked by love. You know, if you were to say, I, I've been noticing this issue. It seems like Ephesians 5.22, this is really hard for you right now. You know, what's making it hard? Am I doing something that's making it hard to submit? You know, that's a much different conversation. When you can say, I, I love you, I want God's best for you. So I want to I help you get there. And just think for a minute about, you know, maybe a separate question of, for wives that are saying, well, what about if my husband is not leading? What do I do? How do I get him to lead? How do I get him to embrace this responsibility? Well, I think you, you first have to, to ask, like any good desire, that's a right desire. You know, a right desire to want him to lead, but how do you handle a, a, an unmet desire, even a good desire, even a biblical desire? How have you prayed for that desire? You know, you see the, the effect of poor leadership on children. I want him to lead for the sake of our children. But, but unfortunately, what happens so often is that a, a wife will push and prod and, and maybe even manipulate with her attitude to, to withhold affection, basically saying, I want you to change and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to force you to change because of how it affects me. We have to have the same goal. If the goal is his godliness and your godliness, that changes how you will treat him. First Peter 3, 1 and 2 talks about the, the wife winning her husband, even the unbelieving husband through her submission, saying, no, I care most about you. I want to I win you. I want you to be conformed to Christ. So for both the, the wife and the husband to, to remember that, that for the husband, I, I am accountable before the Lord for my leadership, and she is accountable for her submission. You know, I can't control her. I can't change her. I'm accountable for me, and I'm going to do everything in my power to help her, to love her, to encourage her, and for a husband who's not leading, for, for a wife just to consider the, the burdened conscience that he would have, the lack of freedom, the lack of joy he will experience if he hasn't embraced this leadership. For, for a wife to say, I want him to experience joy and freedom. I want him to experience the joy of exercising his gifts. He's going to thrive. God has made him to thrive when he's leading in the home. And he's not thriving right now. I want him to have that. I want him to have this joy. I want him to embrace submission to Christ because that's where joy is found. You know, if that is the disposition of a wife, that is a, a much different disposition. That's going to lead you to pray. That's going to lead you to take that burden to the Lord. You're going to bear up under that differently. You're going to encourage him differently. You're going to say, how do I, how do I support him wherever I can? How do I joyfully embrace his leadership wherever I can? And as we move here just to a, to a conclusion, I just have a really a simple, simple application, really simple homework for you. Um, I might lose some friends over this, but if, if you're married, just for husbands, to, to just to ask your wives to say, how is it going? How am I doing at leading in the home? What, what are weaknesses that you see? You know, maybe a harder quest, question to say, what, what makes it hard to follow me? What areas have I made it hard to follow? And maybe you know the answer. Maybe you know what she might say. But if you've never even thought about that before, you know, consider what, what might be the answer and then, and then ask her. And you're, and you're going to find that there, there are areas that you can step in. There might be sinful fears. There might be things you can help her with. There are going to be areas that, that you for sure can grow in. And wives, in the same way, to ask your husbands, 
You know, what has made it hard to lead? In what ways have I made it difficult? In what ways, ways have I not supported your leadership? And we don't ask these questions very often because they're painful. Because our pride gets in the way, I mean, if we're being honest. Because it's hard to hear. It's painful. But, but a humble one, one who is coming under the lordship of Christ is saying, yeah, I, I want to grow for the sake of Christ. I want to grow in this responsibility that I have. I want to I be a more faithful husband and a more faithful wife. And I want any means necessary to get there. If that means some hard conversations, if that means having to hear things I don't want to hear, it's, it's worth it. And, and that does take humility to say, I'm going to humble myself under, under someone else's assessment. But here's the encouragement to you that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. The one who is humble, who is saying, I want to align myself with God's purposes. There is grace there. There is a rich supply of grace. So if you want a fruitful marriage, fruitful parenting, fruitful ministry in the church, be, be humble. Humble yourself under God's commands, under his instructions. In all of this, we remember the, the goal that we have, the ultimate goal. Obviously, big picture, glorifying God. Opportunity in our hearts as we agree, God, you are, you are worthy of glory in all of this. But, but specifically, in Ephesians 5, Paul gives this picture. He goes back and forth in Ephesians 5 of this picture of Christ in the church and a husband and wife, their, their love reflecting what Christ has done for the church. So just consider this goal that we have an opportunity to reflect the love of Christ, to demonstrate you know, the gospel is indeed true. We actually get to demonstrate this is what Christ has done in my heart, in my life. And I want to demonstrate to a watching world that, that Jesus is worthy of all praise in the way that I treat my wife, in the way that we, we go after marriage together, in the way that we sacrificially love and serve each other. Our, uh, our family, the, our new favorite song in our house is the one we sing it last week, the Is He Worthy? Uh, my daughter asked, like, oh, I want, can we have the, the Chris Drent version of that? She, I guess that was better than the Chris Tomlin one or whatever it was on Amazon. But, but just love the song because as we've been in Revelation 4 and 5, just asking the question, you know, is he worthy? Is he worthy of all praise and glory and honor? And, and as I've not thought through this passage, as I've thought through Ephesians 5, and just the sacrifice required you know, in, in, in a marriage, just to ask the question, is he worthy? Is he worthy of, of sacrifice? Is he worthy of whatever it would take? Whatever, whatever conversation, whatever late night, whatever service, whatever humbling thing I have to do, is he worthy of all of that? Is he worthy of putting to death my self-love, my desire for, for comfort? Is Jesus worthy of those things? And if I could sing like Chris, I would sing out that he is worthy, but let me close our time in prayer and just pray that we would indeed say he is worthy of worship. Jesus, you are worthy. You are worthy of all blessing and honor and glory. You are worthy, it says in Revelation, to open the scroll, to usher in your redemptive purposes because you were slain. You purchased for God a people. You purchase us. So I pray that as we think about marriage this morning, that, that our marriages would, would be an opportunity for us to reflect that you are indeed worthy, Jesus. That this week, we would make choices that reflect that in our heart as we're faced with temptation, as we're faced with discouragement, we would be able to, in the heart, say, Jesus, you are worthy. You are worthy. You're worthy of pursuing holiness because we love you, because you died for us. And I pray that this church would, would be marked by marriages that, that put on display your gospel, sacrificial love, not to say that, look at how well we're doing at marriage, but to say, look at what Jesus has done in this place so that you would receive glory, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen.